Gentrification is constantly being talked about. In the past 10 years, the number of Google searches for the word gentrification has more than doubled, and mentions in the news and in literature have gone up. So, people are talking about gentrification, but they often mean different things when they use the term. Gentrification is a process of neighborhood change that includes economic change in a historically disinvested neighborhood by means of real estate investment and new, higher-income residents moving in, as well as demographic change, not only in terms of income level, but also in terms of changes in the education level or racial makeup of residents. Gentrification is complex and needs some explaining. To understand it, there are three key things to consider. The historic conditions, especially policies and practices that made communities susceptible to gentrification. The way that central city disinvestment and investment patterns are taking place today as a result of these conditions. And the ways that gentrification impacts communities. Over the last century, many policies and practices have created racialized patterns of disinvestment in city centers that have left low-income communities of color particularly susceptible to gentrification. From the 1930s through the late 60s, standards set by the federal government and carried out by banks explicitly labeled neighborhoods home to predominantly people of color as risky and unfit for investment. This practice, now known as redlining, meant that people of color were denied access to loans that would enable them to buy or repair homes in their neighborhood. Other housing and transportation policies of the mid-20th century fueled the growth of mostly white suburbs and the exodus of capital from urban centers, in a phenomenon often referred to as white flight. Take the GI Bill as an example. The program guaranteed low-cost mortgage loans for returning World War II soldiers. But discrimination limited the extent to which black veterans were able to purchase homes in the growing suburbs. In fact, the Federal Housing Administration largely required that suburban developers agree to not sell houses to black people in order for the developers to access these guaranteed loans. Left behind in central city neighborhoods, low-income households and communities of color bore the brunt of highway system expansion and urban renewal programs, which resulted in the mass clearance of homes, businesses, and neighborhood institutions, and set the stage for widespread public and private disinvestment in the decades that followed. In more recent history, the foreclosure crisis also contributed to neighborhood-level vulnerability to gentrification. In low-income communities of color, disproportionate levels of subprime lending resulted in mass foreclosure, leaving those neighborhoods vulnerable to investors seeking to purchase and flip homes in bulk. Today, both people and capital are flooding back into these historically disinvested neighborhoods. One reason new people are moving into these neighborhoods is because of their relative affordability. In many U.S. cities, the rental market has gotten increasingly expensive, and even moderate income earners are on the hunt for lower housing costs. This means that in some places, they are looking in historically disinvested communities, often the same neighborhoods previous generations left behind during the days of white flight. These neighborhoods are often characterized by older historic housing stock that appeals to new residents and close proximity to city centers, where jobs, restaurants, and art spaces are increasingly locating. Cities are also investing in revitalizing some of these neighborhoods, for example with improved transit access and infrastructure, in part to draw in newcomers. On the ground, gentrification may look like real estate speculation, with investors flipping properties for large profits, as well as high-end development, and landlords looking for higher-paying tenants, increased investment in neighborhood amenities like transit and parks, changes in land use, for example, from industrial land to restaurants and storefronts, and changes in the character of the neighborhood, as community-run businesses are replaced by businesses catering to new residents' needs. While increased investment in an area can be positive, gentrification is often associated with displacement, which means that, in some of these communities, longtime residents are not able to stay to benefit from new investments in housing, healthy food access, or transit infrastructure. Instead, lower-income families, often families of color, may find themselves facing rent increases, evictions, or other displacement pressures, and left with no other choice but to move to suburban or even exurban areas, far away from their jobs and the businesses and service providers they know, 
This can mean more time commuting, less time spent at home, and increased isolation, depression, and stress levels. For children, displacement can disrupt educational pathways and generate negative health impacts. Even for longtime residents who are able to stay in newly gentrifying areas, changes in the makeup and character of a neighborhood can lead to a reduced sense of belonging or feeling out of place in one's own home. For example, unique cultural vibrancy can be lost as places of worship see their congregants displaced to faraway cities and towns. In addition, family-run businesses and nonprofit organizations may be forced out as their customer base disperses or as their commercial rents rise past what they can sustain, affecting the ability of those who stay to access the goods and services they need. There might also be changes in neighborhood norms and policing, for example, an increased police presence in order for new residents to feel safe. On the whole, we cannot ignore that the adverse impacts of gentrification, ranging from individual health effects to the suburbanization of poverty, are only the most recent wave in a pattern of urban restructuring that has been imposed upon and negatively affected low-income and communities of color over generations. Public, private, and nonprofit sector leaders have the opportunity to implement strategies that give longtime residents a chance to benefit from increased investment in their communities and even be part of driving how some of the changes in their neighborhoods take place. In order to invest in communities without displacement, policies, programs, and financing tools are needed to protect renters from formal and informal displacement pressures, facilitate the production of more affordable housing, and preserve and upgrade the existing affordable housing stock. Involving community residents in planning and decision-making about their neighborhoods and region can and should be a key piece of all three of these strategies. Taken together, these strategies can help keep communities together so that everyone can enjoy access to improved schools, better food options, more job opportunities, and safer neighborhoods qualities we know make cities and regions healthy and vibrant.